Hello everyone, I'm Michael Martin, and it's my privilege to serve as ECFA's president and to welcome you to today's webinar titled Fundraising Fixes, 10 Practical Takeaways from ECFA's Latest Survey. Whether you're with us live today or tuning into the recorded webinar on demand, we appreciate you setting aside this time to invest in your learning and leadership. Joining me today is ECFA's Senior Vice President of Research and Equipping, Dr. Warren Bird. Warren brings his professional expertise to heading our research efforts, and today he'll be providing insights on ECFA's latest fundraising survey. Warren is a former pastor and seminary professor and an author or co-author of, get this, 33 books for ministry leaders. In 2020, he co-authored books on pastoral succession and on healthy mergers. His recent ECFA research projects include The Changing Reality in America's Largest Churches, a huge study of America's biggest attendance churches, and Unleashing Your Board's Potential, one version for nonprofit boards and another version for church boards. You can see the free download links on the slide. Warren, it is great to have you here in studio to help present this webinar. Thanks, Michael. I look forward to the practical insights that we'll be unpacking and discussing together today. That's right. Well, before I go any further, uh, let me formally open us in prayer and ask the Lord's blessing on our time together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much just for this time that we're able to spend together. I thank you for uh, Warren and uh, just his tremendous insights uh, into this world of fundraising fixes. I thank you for each person who's taken time to join us today. Uh, and we do just recognize, Lord, that uh, all provision, it comes from you. Lord, you are our source. And thank you for just the many ways in which you have faithfully provided uh, for ministry today. I just thank you for the insights that we'll be able to uh, share together. We just ask for your wisdom in all things and that we would just continue to glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. We've titled our webinar, Fundraising Fixes, 10 Practical Takeaways from ECFA's Latest Survey, because we want it to be extremely practical and hands-on, right, Warren? In, indeed, and in a spirit of under-promising and over-delivering, you'll actually hear more than 10 ideas. So our prayer is that across our unpackaging, you'll find at least 10 applicable ideas for your context, which you can then narrow and prioritize to five or three or even the one next step that will help you most. That's right. And everything that we say today comes from a report that we just posted online. Uh, you're the first to hear it. Um, we posted that online at ecfa.org slash surveys. Uh, and it's titled New Frontiers in Nonprofit Fundraising. I know, Warren, you spent weeks and weeks analyzing the data for us, and I don't think we've conducted a survey like this one since it was about 2013, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, we repeated some of the questions from 2013, and at various points I'll do kind of a then and now comparison. But we also have a lot of new and first-time questions because the whole world of the Internet, for example, has changed a lot of the dynamics. A lot has changed in that time, that's right. Uh, so for our 2021 version, uh, just quick background, 710 people took their valuable time to share with us what fundraising practices worked well for them uh, across the pandemic, that was part of the time frame. Uh, what has not worked, and then also what's changed. And I just want to say, if you're one of the people who participated in, in that survey, thank you so much. Uh, we jokingly say, but it's true, Warren wouldn't have much of a job without you, so we appreciate it. Thank, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, uh, so indeed, the response has covered a wide range of ministry and church sizes, from annual incomes of under 500000 to annual incomes of well over 10 million. And the, uh, the typical respondent had seen revenue growth over the last three years, and the typical respondent was somewhere between 11 and 50 years old as a ministry or church. In many places across the report itself, we actually compare responses by different sizes of ministry, those that are growing or holding even, and how old it is. So hopefully that will help you feel like, okay, they're speaking to me and groups in my context. 
Great. Now that is helpful background. And again, too, uh, we've thanked everyone who participated in the surveys, but also we want to say we want today's presentation to also be a discussion. We want to hear from you. So please email your questions at any time. You can send those to webinar at ecfa.org, or you can tag us on Twitter uh, to at ecfa or the hashtag ask ecfa. We are going to allow ample time at the end to help field your questions. So let me field one of those anticipated questions right now, and that's the Good. word. What do we mean by fundraising in this report? So churches and ministries largely have three types of income. Cash giving, which of course includes credit card and bank transfer giving as well. Non-cash giving, which would include gifts and kind and other donated services. And other income, which might include program fees, tuition, and the like. Most of the survey and report focuses on the cash giving portion of ministry income. Thank you for that, Warren. And let's now frame today with a, with a quick overview of the world of nonprofit fundraising. Uh, Warren, you know, you and I have been exchanging articles from the Chronicle of Philanthropy and other relevant research with titles like Fundraising out Outlook based on the latest economic report. Charitable giving is expected to return to pre-pandemic patterns in 2021. The dramatic rise in DAF, donor advised fund giving during the pandemic. And they came through in a crisis, but will 2020's new donors keep giving? Yeah. First, not only did givers to the nonprofit sector as a whole come through amazingly during 2020, especially to disaster relief type charities. And in fact, that's underscored by today's release of Giving USA to Giving USA that charitable giving last year grew by an inflation adjusted 3.8%. That's during a pandemic. Okay, but the polls and the economic indicators that we're seeing forecast that such giving will continue. Some examples, the index of consumer sentiment, that is consumer confidence, is up year to year from May 2020 to May 21. The GDP, gross domestic product, had strong growth in the first quarter of 2021. The stock market is up for the year to date. And unemployment has held steady so far this year, just to name a few of the macro indicators. And by the way, we do post occasional excerpts from these articles that uh, Michael Martin and I exchange back and forth at ecfa.org slash news, such as our recap last month that was titled, First Quarter of 2021 Offers Good News to Nonprofits. So we're scouring the news about what helps and what speaks specifically to the nonprofit world. Yeah, that's exactly right, Warren. And I know here at ECFA, we did quite a bit of polling ourselves uh, with our latest report that was titled Remarkable Resilience. So in January 2020, before most of us had even heard of the word pandemic, we ran our annual survey of how the previous year ended, that would be 2019, and what the outlook was for the present year, meaning 2020. And the response to both questions was rather optimistic and robust. Then, when the pandemic hit, we decided to, to track the economic impact of the pandemic as often as quarterly, which we did. And thanks to all of you who participated in one or more of those surveys. And as our fourth and final report, as the title expressed, we saw a, quote, remarkable resiliency, both among ministries and churches and among the givers whom God used to fund the mission. Right. And now almost halfway, it's hard to believe we're halfway <laughs> into 2021. Uh, question is, are evangelicals continuing to be some of the most generous people on planet Earth? Yes, that is just what we are seeing. And now, within that context, let's talk about fundraising in particular. Now, our first set of slides look at P2, 
people dynamics, the fundraising team, the CEO, the board. Then the second set of slides will look at very tactical issues like online giving, social media, the acceptance of cryptocurrency, and more. By the way, if you've already downloaded the report, we'll pretty much follow the flow of it if you want to follow along that way. Yeah, that's exactly right. But don't tune out <laughs> because we're also going to be unpacking uh, and Warren and I are going to be walking through uh, in some really helpful ways, uh, some ways just to digest and make this survey really practical. Uh, this particular slide now gets into the actual content of the report. So Warren, speaking of the report, maybe explain the layout since you repeated this pattern uh, across the report, right? Yeah. So, okay, the very top line gives the topic. In this case, it's areas to fix. Then we put the actual question from the survey. In this case, it's how would you rate your need in the next 12 months to significantly fix and or significantly improve the following? Then we show you the top answers. In this case, new donor acquisition is first followed closely by moving existing donors up the donor pyramid. And interestingly, this question was similar to the one we ask in the to one we asked in the 2013 survey. And of the eight options given back then, the number one at the time was moving donors up the donor pyramid. And the second highest was donor acquisition. Well, I notice here too, Warren, that acquiring phone or text numbers of major donors, that ranked at the bottom with only 28% of the vote, if you will. Uh, that to me, that one seems like a, a major mispriority here. I hope all ministries and churches are beginning to track which givers prefer to be contacted by phone or text. But remember, this question asks how high a priority it is. Uh, gotcha. So. So while hopefully it's important to all, clearly it's not the top priority for many. That makes sense. Um, and by the way, Warren, your next big research project is to help ministries and churches study their donors or givers, those two terms obviously being uh, synonymous, but uh, that also includes asking how they like to be communicated to, and we'll tell a bit more about that later in this webinar. So yes, just very excited about, <laughs> we want to help you, and I think we've got a way to do it. But let's, uh, let's think about the next slide. But as we do, let me make one more comment about the format. Notice in the upper right-hand corner, a little yellow idea bubble. Each time you look at one of our tables, if you wonder, okay, but what could I do with this information? Each yellow action bubble makes a suggestion. In this case, our idea is for you to do your own ranking of these nine options and then create a strategic plan based on whatever is your number one top item. I think that's so great, Warren, and I, for one, I just really appreciate how practical that you're trying to make all of this good data, uh, not just a lot of numbers and tables, but uh, I think that that's one of the greatest features of this report is, is those little action bubbles. So uh, just kudos to you and the team for that. I think that'll make it uh, really, really useful. Well, that was actually one of our feedback that we get. We, we read mm. your feedback. We, hopefully we get better all the time because we're, we're reading what you say and you give us ideas and you say, help us in this way. And that's our heart and joy to do that. So moving on, this second table is probably the hardest to understand. After all your nice words, now I'm going to give you the <laughs> hardest one. Uh, we ask people if they agreed that their fundraising program has been extremely effective over the past 12 to 18 months. That, that means during the pandemic. Then we divided the responses between those who said their fundraising program was effective, which, by the way, well over half of the respondents I'm happy to report, said they are effective, and those who said it was ineffective. Then in a bunch of different areas, I show you the difference between those with effective fundraising programs and those with ineffective fundraising programs. Right, and your learning on this page is that having the right people 
and right priorities for the paid fundraising staff and also the paid CEOs. That makes the biggest difference, right, between effective and ineffective fundraising programs. So, Warren, can you just help maybe please unpack that uh, particular finding a little bit more? Sure. Look, please, at the top row that circled where we drill down on the paid fundraising staff for those that have paid fundraising staff. Among those who have an effective fundraising program, 84% say they're getting their desired fundraising results from their fundraising staff. Among those with ineffective fundraising programs, only 30% say they're getting their desired fundraising results from their fundraising staff. Bottom line, if you're not happy with your fundraising, start by looking at the priorities and performance of any paid fundraising staff that you may have or be using. Well, and an even bigger issue is the CEO or the equivalent top executive, uh, whatever that title is in your organization, among those who have an effective fundraising program, 92% said that they are getting their desired fundraising results from their CEO. Yeah. And since the CEO's pivotal role surfaced in the 2013 survey, we created several new questions and assessments about the CEO, which we built into our 2021 survey. So let's go to the next table and look at the first set. We're still comparing effective versus ineffective fundraising programs. And of all the questions we ask about the CEO in particular, the top rated value in effective fundraising programs was the one I circled. Agreement that the CEO effectively shares the fundraising role with others. Now, depending on the size of your ministry or church, the CEO could share fundraising responsibilities with paid staff, with board members, and or with volunteers. Right. And again, the 36-page New Frontiers report that we're launching today at ecfa.org slash surveys has all these details and a lot more. We're not going to be able to even get into all of it during our time today on the webinar. For this webinar, I think most people appreciate, Warren, that you're focusing on just the highlights, right? <laughs> well, you tell me, those of you who are listening, when you do the evaluation, not you, Michael, but, <laughs> but everybody else, uh, tell us, did we give you the right level of uh, detail? Because we do read those very carefully. Meanwhile, meanwhile, here's another slide that continues to look at the CEO's role and it shows the area with the greatest difference between effective and ineffective fundraising programs. I circle the line that reads, our CEO is extremely effective in achieving his or her specific annual fundraising goals, where 79% of those with effective fundraising programs agreed but if you had an ineffective fundraising program, only 41% agreed. That's a, quite a gap. Later, we'll show a statement about annual goals in general, but this one is asking whether the CEO has annual fundraising goals and is following them. Right, and a great practical takeaway here is that uh, very question, can the board or executive team work with the CEO first to set annual fundraising goals and then to brainstorm on how to accomplish them. Uh, in fact, in 2019, Warren, you did some major survey work of boards as well, separate surveys and reports for nonprofits and for church boards, which I mentioned earlier. And Warren, you found that the issue of goal setting made a big difference in board context as well, right? Indeed. And those are free downloads at ecfa.surveys, uh, uh, slash surveys. Both reports have the title Unleashing Your Board in them. So now let's look at one more table about the CEO. We're looking at what the CEO does best. Well, and I'm seeing here lots of high, high percentages here. It looks like a little competition to determine what the CEO does best. Yeah, the survey was generally very quite positive about CEOs. 
And yes, even when we removed all the CEO votes, you know, who had participated in the survey and looked only at what their staff or board members or others said about CEO, the sentiment, the sentiment was still delightfully positive towards the CEO. In this slide, you'll see that the very top rated qualities of the CEOs are the ones I think you would have hoped would be at the very top. Here's the first one. Our CEO understands and models the biblical approach to fundraising and generosity. A biblical approach to, and it was for nonprofits, the word fundraising, and to churches, we use the word generosity. Second, our CEO is extremely effective at creating and communicating our vision, mission, and values and strategic plan both internally and externally. That's a mouthful. But a lot of people said, yep, that's our CEO and our leader, whatever the, the, the title of the executive person. That's great. And I know our next slide uh, shifts to ask about donor relationships. And specifically, do one or more staff members have specific donors that they are building relationships with? Okay, looky here. 91% said yes, they do have specific relationships. And among those yes responses, we then ask, okay, how many specific givers is the CEO building re relationships with? And the median average, and by the way, this ended up being about the same from the 2013 survey. The median average was 30 people for the CEO. And another question we ask about how many givers the CDO, Chief Development Officer or Equivalent Fundraising Advancement Development Person, whatever you call that there. There are a lot of titles out there. Um, okay, how many people did that person, whatever you call that person, have re was building relationship with? And the median average there was 75 people. Now, very quickly, the next slide affirms that the more effective your fundraising program is, the more likely you are for one or more staff members to have specific donors that they're building relationships with. It's like they say, Warren, right? It's all about relationships. <laughs> uh, I'd say, too, it's easy to guess that, that most people are building relationships with major donors, but actually not. that's not exclusively the case. Outside of our survey, I recently came across some research reported in the Chronicle of Philanthropy, which looked at the giving habits of mid-level donors. Um, and to define that, that's typically someone who earns $100,000 to $200,000 a year. The research there found that among these donors, a lot or all even of their giving goes to charities with which they have a personal relationship. So the translation here is that one way to develop major donors is to build those personal relationships with your mid-level donors. And also other studies affirm that nonprofits and churches typically have many givers who have the potential to give much more. Excellent. Our next question asks about the board. It finds that most board members are donors and that they personally help with the fundraising, with the exception being boards at very large ministries, which I'm guessing are typically not set up as fundraising boards. And interestingly, when the CEOs are asked about their board members, they report a greater sense that their board members are expected to give financially than the actual board members uh, report. So it may be helpful either as you recruit board members or as you do an annual board member affirmation of responsibilities to clarify the role of fundraising expectations for board members. That's right. I'm a big believer in that, Warren, big believer in clarifying expectations. And on that note, ECFA recently published a book titled ECFA Tools and Templates for Effective Board Governance. It offers just a bunch of resources, including the board member annual affirmation statement that, Warren, you just mentioned. And not only did I just mention it, but I used it last night in uh, speaking with a church board. So far, our slides have focused on the various values and players behind fundraising. And this slide completes that series by looking at 
impact measurement. Specifically, effective fundraising programs work hard to measure the impact of their ministries, programs, products, and services, and to communicate those impact measures to donors as well as to their own staff and board. Yeah, I would just piggyback on that too and say, I, I think whether we're investing our money, time, or talent, we all want to know that our efforts are making a tangible difference. Indeed. The gist of my pastor's sermon last Sunday was t- asking all of us to pray, God, please break my heart for what breaks yours, and then unleash me to change the world to make it better in that area. And I think a lot of people feel that way. Right. And Warren, uh, among your options uh, for doing so, and those who are <laughs> those who are with us uh, on the webinar today, uh, really the vital ministries of 2,568 different ECFA member organizations, and we're so we're so proud of the members who are part of ECFA. And, and not only did you have that number, but that number changes every month that goes up, and you're. Uh... You're right on top of it. Good like to see you. Who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now let's move to a bunch of very tactical slides. This first one asks about the shift to online giving. We ask if half or more of your total donor base was giving online just before the pandemic hit and then one year later. So the growth in online giving was definite but somewhat modest. Right. And perhaps one, just one application here is that ministries and churches need to keep inviting their givers to shift to online. So not just that one-time invitation of uh, while we're in that crisis period, but to keep doing so. And even to invite them to set up recurring giving, such as their bank or credit card automatically makes the donation on a designated time each month. Uh, One specific question here was just on that. For your total donor base, what percent both give online and also are enrolled in a recurring giving program? And among our survey respondents, only 20% said that half or more of their donors were doing both. And I, I previewed this webinar last week with a leading expert on ministry fundraising, and, and he made a comment that I scribbled it down, and then I emailed it to him, and I said, can I, can I quote you in the, in the seminar, uh, the webinar today? And he s- fixed his quote up and said yes. So here, here's what he said, quote, the shift doesn't just happen. If you're not deliberate about inviting givers to set up recurring giving, and most are not, he says, then not many people will make that shift. And in fact, he continued, To be really successful with monthly donors, you need an attractive program with a name and a rationale for monthly giving, and then you need a strategy to promote it. So, Michael, as you said, it doesn't just happen. That's right. That was worth the price of admission for this webinar. That's that's just some great insight. Well, it's it's like um, somebody studied... um, people who gave money in their wills and those who didn't and found that it was churches and ministries that put a little reminder. This was back in newsletter days. And, you know, have you remembered this church or this ministry in your will? Well, you know, why not plant those seeds and see what God does? But if, if we don't ask, often we don't receive. That's right. Being intentional and not overlooking even the small things. Yeah, that's a great reminder. So, Warren, our, getting back to our report, our actual report here, and, and for most pages, provides commentary and analysis at the bottom of the page. And I thought your points here were particularly interesting. You noted that the lowest percentage of online givers in early 2020, so that, again, pre-pandemic, were in ministries or churches founded more than 50 years ago. The highest percentage of online givers by early 2021 were in ministries or churches founded 11 to 50 years ago. And most surprising to me, the highest percentage of ministries or churches whose online donors were recurring givers were those with smaller annual income. So way to go, smaller budget ministries. You've uh, you've really emphasized the need and, and reminded people that online giving 
happens. And, you know, I think about that personally. Uh, I think we have one online giving, and it's to the local crisis pregnancy center. And it's, mm. it's not a large amount, but we've, we've given there year after year and haven't missed a month because of the recurring. Yeah. So if people want to geek out on various uh, correlations that I found in the data, they will find lots of them in the report down at the bottom of each page and a whole appendix uh, area. So now our next slide looks at the role of cyber currency, also called cryptocurrency, stuff like Bitcoin. Okay, so don't laugh. 21 million U.S. adults own some money in cryptocurrency. We found that 5% of men, and that's growing. We found that 5% of ministries and churches are set up to receive such gifts. And 2% have actually received a cryptocurrency donation in the last year. However, if we limit to those that were already set up to receive such a gift, 74% have received one. Hmm. So I'm going to suspect that means a donor offered to give uh, by Bitcoin or the like in the ministry or church. They probably figured out how to receive that donation. Is that right? <laughs> uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. All right. The next slide asks about sizes of gifts. In the most, in the most recent 12-month physical year, which would, which would overlap with the pandemic, what percent of your giving came from smaller gifts? Now, let's define the, or we did define those as $1,000 or less annually. Second category, from median gifts, that would be 1000 to 9999 annually. And from major gifts, so that would be more than $10,000 uh, given annually. And of those three groups, the most gifts at 47% were smaller gifts. Well, and here again, your report offers a lot of detailed analysis, including some notes that ministries or churches with lower annual income received a higher percentage of small gifts and a lower percentage of major gifts, and also that financially declining ministries or churches received a higher percentage of small gifts and a lower percentage of major gifts. Yeah. We also ask about sources of giving. Where did the most giving come from during the pandemic? And among the five options we offered, the top choices were was major donors as the greatest source of giving, followed by face-to-face -face visits, which during the pandemic meant Zoom screen to Zoom screen visits. Third place for the most giving during the pandemic was direct mail. Right. And you also ask, which is the uh, growing fastest as a source of giving, right? Yeah. And the top answer there was email. Right. And then also we asked, uh, which is most helpful for new donor acquisition, right? Yes. And the top answer there was I have a typo in my notes. I don't know. I, I looked that up in the Q&A section. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go back. Oh, and we'll go, oh no, it? no. It's, it's by new donors. New donors were the top group there. Got it. Okay. And then I don't see it on this table, but uh, did you happen to ask, Warren, which brought in the most money overall? Okay. No typo on that one. We did. We did. Here was the question. For your fundraising, which channel or methodology currently generates the largest amount of net dollars for you? And we offered 15 options. And the top choice, drum roll maybe. So are you asking for sound effects? Well, yeah, you're okay. the president who, you know, you wear every hat, right? All right, here it is. Okay, for generating the most dollars during the pandemic was major donors, followed by face-to-face -face visits, Zoom-to-Zoom -zoom visits, followed by email. Well, and then here, too, uh, going to the, in the next slide, you asked about social media fundraising priorities for 2021. It says that the highest social media attention in 2021 uh, will go to Facebook, the second highest to Instagram, However, I looked at uh, the actual New Frontiers report 
uh, and again, we'll just keep plugging that the free download at ecfa.org slash surveys. Um, what I was most intrigued by, Warren, uh, really uh, what came in second and also came in third place, the don't know and none. I, I don't use those two social medias. <laughs> <laughs> You're a jokester today. This is good. Um, but no, I didn't. Uh, I, I think I was just surprised to see that lack of focus that really seemed like troublesome and, and even dangerous territory. Yeah. To be able to say that. I agree. And that's why our yellow action bubble for this table reads set clear 2021 social media goals, meaning which social media to emphasize and how much money and staff time to expend. And suppose you wonder, okay, about TikTok, which is one of America's most popular apps where some 50 million U.S. Uh, users spend an average of 46 minutes every day. Ah, interestingly, it's a top choice as a fundraiser for 0% of mm. our survey takers. And it's a second choice for 1%. Just saying. A recent Pew study, by the way, found that among U.S. adults who use Facebook, which was our number one uh, social media fundraising expectation for 2021, 70% said they visit the site daily, which includes about half, 49%, who do so several times a day. By comparison, 59% of uh, both Snapchat and Instagram users, users say that they use visit those platforms at least daily, as do 54% of YouTube users and 40% of Twitter users. Man, we as a society are on social media and fundraising. Who, wherever your people are, y you got to find them there, it sounds like. Okay, this next table asks about communication technologies for fundraising and it shows that uh, get this social media handwritten notes are the most used by 96 percent of the ministries and churches in our survey group yeah that's right there's still nothing beats that old-fashioned personal touch i would argue <laughs> so um in this slide warren you list the top three but your full report lists seven options. And I was intrigued that the seventh and thus lowest ranking option, again, uh, maybe seems like a little bit of a miss, was uh, text messaging. But I guess there's this caveat here of text messaging with a video link. With a video link. I think that's growing. But I think that also reflects a problem with the survey creator, which would be me. My question assumed wrongly that everyone was set up to send mass text with video links, and certainly that's not the case. So had I limited the question, had I first said, well, do you send or, or do you have that capability of sending text messages with video links, then the percentage of yes responses might have been higher. And, and also earlier, we talked about emails with video links, and, and maybe not everybody is set up to do that, too. But I do encourage our listeners to explore and experiment with whatever technologies you've got or those, you know, millennial and Gen Z people working with your ministry can help you figure out to put those short videos in your people's hands. There is good reasons that the wor reason that the world's number two search engine today and for many years has been YouTube. But back to the report. One of my notes does say that ministries with growing incomes are more likely to include video links in their text and emails. Now again, is it chicken and egg which comes first, which is causative? I don't know that, but I do know the two go hand in hand. So our next slide was about an open-ended question about software. What primary database software does your organization use for storing and managing information? And we got more than 90 different, yes, nine zero different answers. And here were just the top five. And again, look at the report. And actually, I did a whole appendix page in the report with lots of the uh, options and variations and which did larger ministries prefer and which did smaller ministries prefer. But bottom line, if you take all 710 people, 
Blackboard's Razor's Edge came in first, and Salesforce came in second. And uh, you can see, again, the more rankings and also which was the favorite, you know, just because you use it, uh, how satisfied are you with it? So we asked that as well. Good. Okay. So going here to this next slide, Warren, I heard you say that you and your team put more work into analyzing this uh, area than any other question. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. We, we also ask, it, it's open-ended question, and we just said, what resource has most helped train you and or your team in fundraising? And you could say whatever you want. And, so, and people did. And so first we identified the big buckets or categories of response. And the top listed was the idea of conferences, webinars, workshops, or coursework. So online stuff that you learn. And interestingly, we did this same question back in 2013. And of course, online was just emerging at that point, And that was minimal part of the response. So, so then we took what you said for webinars and all this online stuff and we ranked them and michael ecfa's uh free webinars were first uh mm -hmm. among the people who took the survey so i'm glad we're helping followed by uh mission increase cla that is christian leadership alliance veritas major gift academy and more and again i list uh several of them on the document Right. And so, Warren, you mentioned uh, ECFA webinars. Indeed, last year, ECFA broke all kinds of records for our webinars, including one I think we should mention on, on this webinar uh, related to the fundraising survey. We should mention last year's webinar, Fundraising Trends, Traps, and Integrity Tips, a very popular webinar that we did. But, but all of the past webinars uh, that ECFA has done, all of them are available for free replay. Uh, and that'll help train our listeners and their teams. Yes, we're in the training. And, and in that regard, wait, there is more on this slide. The second biggest bucket, bucket for training was mentoring, such as a board member or experienced staff member informally teaching the ropes to someone else. Then third came books, and our report lists the most mentioned books by name. Fourth was software. And fifth was paid consultants. Right. In the next slide, uh, this one, it shows various ways that ECFA's many resources, and, and most of them are free, uh, how these resources have helped people with fundraising. Now, Warren, I see on this list that research reports such as this one have really helped a lot of people. Yeah, that brought us a smile because that's what we ask God to do. Uh, just that. So it's our joy. All right. Well, and I love what you did here now going to the, this next slide. Uh, you asked a very specific question about best practices in fundraising. Yeah, this was another open-ended question. That's why I spent weeks <laughs> tallying it up. And we actually asked three applications. So during the pandemic, what worked particularly well for, here we go, virtual engagements for developing new donors and for developing existing donors. And then we read through hundreds of responses, picked five different answers for each. And let me just give you a couple. Here's one of the ideas. For virtual engagement, mostly Zoom calls, several went on site into the field and hosted online video chats for major donors with workers there allowing them to connect with the work directly. What a good idea. And of course, you can all the ideas we picked are ones that you can probably use as the pandemic uh, lifts and, and God willing disappears. Uh, here's another idea. For developing new donors, some offered virtual tours of their facilities, including a staff Q&A. So we walked out, you know, we show you the ECFA office. If we, I mean, we, we don't raise funds, but somebody does the equivalent of their office, and here's the CEO, and, uh, and you know, let's have a few questions there. And this allowed donors to have a personal experience with their mission no matter where they were located. I love that idea. Uh, that, that's a really good one. Um, and then beyond that, right, the report details 15 yeah. <laughs> other ideas like that. Yeah. 
every reader should find at least one idea there that they could incorporate into their context. Right. And now uh, we could keep going. We could keep mining the report. But uh, let's pause here for some Q&A. Uh, this has been a lot of information. Uh, please ask us questions that will help you apply it to your situation. Uh, while people are emailing their questions to webinar at ecfa.org or posting them on social media, uh, Warren, let's give a quick introduction to our next study because it might help a lot of uh, a lot of our listeners. I, I, but again, for your questions, uh, email those to webinar at ecfa.org. Um, and I know too, Warren, you've, you've learned that the majority of ministries and churches have not recently studied their donors. Um, speaking of practical, that's another area where we can help with that, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm very excited about this. Ministries and churches, you, you know who gives, but you don't know why they give. What motivates their giving? And how do giving triggers different among, differ among the generations, such as between a millennial giver, say, and a baby boomer giver? So if people will go, now this is a different web link than we've been giving. There's a new one, ecfa.org slash ygive, W-H-Y-G-I-V-E, ecfa.org slash ygive. You'll see our idea to help you study your givers. You'll see a sample of the survey that we have in mind. You'll see how you can add your own questions uh, to the survey. You see how we'll create a special report just for you and a whole lot more. You'll get the idea of how that works. Do take a look. Uh, we'd love to serve you in that capacity. That's right. And I know that's going to help a lot of people, Warren. And just two weeks ago, our first organization launched their survey and they're already learning a whole lot. It's been extremely beneficial. Uh, but meanwhile, let's go to Q&A. Uh, and again, you can email those questions to webinar at ecfa.org. Email us your questions. Uh, but the one question that uh, I would have to Warren would be, uh, tell us, did the survey ask anything about channels for new donor acquisition for new donor acquisition mm -hmm. yes among those that were okay i limited first to those that that rated their fundraising program as effective and among those direct mail rated highest for new donor acquisition followed by email followed by social media followed by text messages. And you'll find all those details at the bottom of page 22 of the full report. Good. Okay. Here's another question for you, Warren, as well. Uh, did you do any analysis between the fundraising practices of growing ministries and churches versus those that are holding uh, even or maybe even declining. So a question about that. So yeah. Based on the financial condition of the organization. Yeah, I did. And uh, and you'll find eight different places in the report or appendix where I distinguish b between growing and non-growing and also between larger uh, budget ministries and smaller budget ministries. Now, some are the same, like um, what social media are you going to emphasize most in 2021 for fundraising and facebook was pretty dominant the answer whether you're large or small or growing or non-growing um, but other questions differed for example um, on this issue of how the three gift sizes and uh, what the how big the smaller gift um, category was for your giving um, those that are growing tended to receive larger gifts as a percentage uh, of their gift, and those that were smaller tended to receive a larger percentage of smaller gifts. Um, again, is that causative? I, I don't think it needs to be. And, but if, if that helps you identify where you are and where you could go, you know, to be frank, um, everyone, most people who watch surveys and read surveys like this, the question they want to ask is, how does our ministry, our church, our organization, 
how does it compare to what others like us are experiencing? And so in some ways, if you say, okay, we're normal, I don't have to be satisfied there, but, but at least, you know, let's not beat ourselves for, for experiencing what most people like us experience. On the other hand, uh, always dream, you know, okay, if this is where we are, how do we build a stronger trajectory towards a stronger fundraising base. And that's what we hope to do with showing you all these best practices, if you will, across the report. Right, okay, Warren, here's a, a question that came in related to social media fundraising. Um, I'm not sure how much uh, you'll be able to speak into this, but I think it is a good question. And it is, uh, many Christians have left mainstream social media like Facebook and Twitter Twitter over censorship, um, and that is a trend that we're seeing. So the question is, how should ministries consider uh, engaging in platforms that discriminate against Christian messaging? I know that's something that folks are up against, yeah. um, but let's just say, Warren, that an organization has decided that they're wanting to uh, maybe not put all their eggs in that social media fundraising basket. Um, Anything else practical from the survey that we found in terms of other really effective types of fundraising that people can use in the alternative uh, to social media? Uh, so things like we talked about fundraising through email. We talked mm -hmm. about text messaging, some of those opportunities that are and, maybe And untapped. one of the things we talked about the most is that personal touch, mm -hmm. is that donor relationship, is that sharing the vision. Uh, is that dreaming it together. And uh, whatever your size, your limitations or challenges, and whether the personal touch is across a video screen or, or getting mm -hmm. together, that can't be emphasized enough. And of course, there's no social media needed to do that. But, but also ask yourself, where are the people that you're mm -hmm. trying to reach? Where are they gathering? I mean, People go on social media because that seems to be where a lot of people are. But, but if you don't want to go there, where can you go that a lot of people are? And, and not just the personal touches with friends, but how can you ask them, who of your friends and acquaintances can we touch? Mm -hmm. So much of fundraising is through a relational context, just as going to church still to this day 80 to 90 percent of people who come to church for the first time come at the invitation of a friend, acquaintance, relative, or some relationship. Mm -hmm. Now, and this might sound again like uh, a not so shameless plug, I guess, of the why do donors give survey, but. Uh, oh, I is wonder... that what you were setting me <laughs> no, up? No, no, no. I just, as you were sharing that, Warren, I was also thinking for those ministries that are wrestling with yeah. that and where to find uh, donors and givers and how are they engaging. Uh, tell us, you know, would, would an exercise like the, the Why Do Donors Give survey be able to be a helpful tool in some of that analysis? Yeah, it, it, so we, don't, we never get like the emails or anything of your donors. You survey your donors, uh, and, and so you... Um, you don't learn a particular about, you know, Joe and Susie Hernandez as your donors, but you do learn generalities about your donors in terms of what, why do they give? What, what's the motivation? And like in several of our questions, we give a whole bunch of motivations and say, which is the one God uses in your life to trigger you to want to share of your resources with others. And knowing that, you can know how to present your ministry so that it speaks to the heart passion that people have. It's, it's easy to default. And, and, you know, what we've seen from baby boomers or the elder generations and appeal to that. But millennials and Gen Z have a whole different set of motivations, uh, cause, compassion, and other things. And, and whatever is representative of your ministry, by learning that this is who you are or are not reaching, you can then know how to do a better job of communicating your ministry. And also, that's another whole set of questions. How well do people feel like XYZ ministry, whoever it is doing the survey, is communicating their their vision with clarity and their momentum and the the, the change lives by Jesus Christ, 
And it's, it's kind of like holding up a mirror, and it will help you better assess how you're communicating. Right. And uh, Warren, you were also talking uh, there uh, about the differences even between generations, uh, their giving, behaviors, patterns. I think that was something really insightful that we found last time we ran a survey like this, why do donors give, uh, but also just found something very timely, interesting that came across my desk today that was talking about even for organizations, you know, uh, let's say one major priority right now is uh, communicating impact, but this headline was even talking about there's differences between generations and even defining that term impact you mm -hmm. know for a certain segment of generations that might mean how effective financially are you using your resources uh for i think gen z this upcoming generation uh one of the findings uh was really that to them impact actually meant accomplishing goals you know so there's just some really interesting things uh, that we'll find as a result of those survey efforts. But, you know, we appreciate uh, those who will engage and make that possible. Um, okay, since you said it, <laughs> ecfa.org slash why give. Okay, next question. Okay, and I think we've got time for one more question here. Um, this goes back to table two, Warren. Your comments uh, note you asked how much of the survey takers time is allocated to fundraising and those with effective fundraising programs they indicated much more time uh, so it was 29 percent versus 12 percent is there any meaningful differences based on the role of the survey taker i think that's a great question yeah um ceos tended to be a little rosier a little mm. more optimistic uh, in their overall outlook, and CEOs were the majority person who took the survey. Uh, the paid fundraising staff tended to rate things a little bit lower. And then, I mean, we had a zillion different roles. We did ask people's roles and where they fit in the organization. Um, so there was variety, but there, there was no night and day um, uh, opposition where I, and, and I would have brought that out if there was. Got it. Okay. All right. Well, uh, that kind of brings us to the end of the time that we had for questions live here on the webinar. But if you continue to have those questions as you take more time to really dive into this survey uh, and apply it to your situation, you can email those questions to webinar at ecfa.org. And I know Warren and our team would be happy to help answer some of those questions. But a few other important announcements here as we wind down our time together. Uh, speaking of social media, ECFA is excited about our growing YouTube channel. We offer several series such as ECFA Explains and the ECFA Standards Simplified. Uh, within that, there's also topics that range from fundraising to Capitol Hill updates and much more. You can access these great free resources and subscribe at the link on your screen. And while I have this opportunity, we've also talked about just how much we appreciate uh, our ECFA members on the webinar today. I want to just echo that and uh, again say a very sincere thank you to many of our over 2,500 ECFA members who are represented on today's webinar. And then to Warren, for other friends who are also with us today, uh, we should share that now is a great time to take the next step in becoming ECFA accredited. ECFA accreditation would not only help your ministry achieve high standards of financial integrity, but also demonstrate your commitment to accountability to your givers in a watching world, uh, which by the way, does not hurt in the world of fundraising. Uh, now through June 30th, ECFA is waiving the standard initial $500 application fee and offering free coaching. That's a huge benefit uh, to help your ministry take the next steps in becoming accredited. Uh, next up is easy. Just email me today at president at ecfa.org, and I'd love to share uh, further easy next steps with you to get started in becoming an accredited member of ECFA and waiving the $500 application fee. 
Well, that brings us to the end of today's ECFA webinar on fundraising fixes. We hope this has been meaningful to you. You'll be receiving another email tomorrow with a link to the recording and other related materials. And again, Warren, I'd just like to thank you uh, for just the excellent insights, your presentation, all the work that went into the excellent research uh, that's part of this project. And then also to say thank you to each person who joined us for this webinar. May God bless you as you continue to shine bright the light of Jesus Christ in these times.